I think this was something, some Ghanaian uh, thing which I stole a rhythm from. It's me picking out a rhythm underneath. At this point in the process, much the most important tool for me is this drum machine or the rhythm box. This allows me, with the sound of real drums, to store in computer memory any drum pattern I can conceive of or steal and use this as the, the basis for my songwriting. For instance, put one up here in the machine, um, which is got quite a simple rhythm, but I can use it to illustrate what I do. rhythm set up I can start say adding claps in there When I've got my rhythms locked into the uh, drum machine, I begin improvising normally, and um, often the rhythm will suggest the type of uh, sound that I should use on synth or whatever, and then these ideas will be, uh, be formed around the rhythm. Gabriel's work really does focus on drums and rhythm as the main core element. So after I'd made this original set of loops, I mean, after I'd made just this section alone, I kind of went on to write a melody. Um, and I was just playing around and I think I was, I was on my uh, computer keyboard in live and came up with this. And it was just these chords over that loop. And it just worked really well. Oh, I used Monarch, uh, which is a Moog Model D uh, um, uh, recreation character. Um, and with the drums, it just worked really well. Then I came up with this chord pattern for the chorus, basically. developed into this section here. At that point I was like, I need something extra, I need a vocal line. And I came up with this. Uh, this originally 
in, was intended just to be a placeholder for my vocals or for just the, the melody line that I could hear in my head for the vocals and uh, turned out that I liked it so much that I just developed it more into a synth patch than a uh, actual vocal line and we've got some bits later on that were quite nice Okay, so the first things first is I exported out all of the stems from Ableton Live. Um, I basically took all of the MIDI files and rather than bouncing them, brought them into Pro Tools because um, I wanted to get into Pro Tools as soon as possible. Now, um, although in this session you can see all WAV files mostly, uh, it's just because it, my computer was dying so I had to commit some of them and freeze others. Um, it won't run, it keeps on crashing otherwise. Okay, so that's not gonna work. It's really not having a good time at the moment. The first thing that I did was export out the samples from Ableton. Um, and pull across the MIDI, which you can see here. But I actually really like the Ableton samples, and there wasn't a satisfying kit, so I created my own. And imported them. Once I've got some of the rhythm and melody ideas, the next thing I have to do is make a rough recording so that I can play this to the musicians who will be arriving very soon to start work with me. The next thing on the list was to record some actual instruments and I decided to work on the drums first because I needed something a bit more live to give it a bit more feel. Um, so, didn't have access to the drummer, so I hopped on the drums and played them extremely badly, extremely poorly. Uh, and the recordings weren't great, and I heavily had to quantize them, but they, you know, it is what it is. So I reinforced that with a couple of samples from Contact, I think it's the 60s drummer or vintage drummer, and that worked out to sound like this together. Together, the drums sound like this, including the electric 6006. I then decided to record some bass guitar. And for me, the piece didn't really work until, or at least this last section didn't really work until this guitar was in. Just playing the same note and in octaves, but kind of adds a lot of feel to the overall composition. Recordings I would make of myself. And then it's analyzed and broken up into its component parts within the computer. It changes the volume and pitch of the sound. And the tilt of the pen actually affects the way the sound is, is, is resynthesized in the computer. 
and I can add an additional level of performance to it that way. So, onto the sound design section. Now, I was I originally played around with using some Wally effects, but I didn't feel like it would actually fit into the piece. Uh, so I started collecting some samples and uh, working on integrating those. And I think what I've done here, if I remember correctly, is I side-chained the... Um, uh, I side chained this sample up here to vocal one. And you can see that they come in together. Now that was a fan of some sort and it's had a bit of reverb to give it a wider feel and also a flanger put on and together the vocal and sample sound like this which gives it this dirty gritty character um, and it kind of helps add a bit of bite to the whole thing. The whole focus for this was to try and add a bit of ear candy. The more inventive sounds get, the more they become subjective and they become sounds in the ears of the beholder. A ray gun, a force field, they're interchangeable. Most of these sounds are just so abstract that the ultimate judgment has to be in the hands of, of one person. I believe that is the Kima. Um, and it can be heard all through Ben Burt's work in the prequel trilogy of Star Wars and anything subsequent to those. Um, he just uses it he's everywhere. Um, and after jamming around with that f patch for a little bit, I chopped these samples up and turned them into what you hear here. So... The most noticeable one in the final track is this vocal, reverse vocal. And this is what you hear on the vocal. These elements are just really acting as risers, where you typically have some form of sub drop or effect that would transition you into another section to indicate that it was a meaningful change. Vocal wise, this took quite a while for me to do. I don't usually sing, I don't usually write lyrics, and it felt strange. Uh, I had a vague vocal melody in my head, so that helped quite a lot by the end of writing this. And this is what I came up with. The distant stories that are making up the world The fire that burns beneath is waiting to be heard Peter Gabriel usually sticks to quite a monotonous drone through the verses, and then bit more vocal range in the chorus or the pre-chorus. He is a heartbreaker, he's tired of the evil world. And finally, this last section altogether equated to quite a big, hard-hitting section. It just all came together at this end piece. I think what has to be quite clear by this point is I'd listened to so much Peter Gabriel that some of these decisions were ones I'm making on a musical basis and something that I felt as a musician that I was able to connect with as opposed to a definitive theoretical choice.